of the coolest things about Dungeons and Dragons, or any RPG really, is the ability to invent anything you want really. Um, you can create new magic items, uh, you can create new races, uh, fantastic races that you can play, it's something that you've maybe read about or or seen in a movie, or just something new that you'd want to be or do. Uh, you can invent new classes. Um, the possibilities are truly endless, and only limited by your imagination. And that's how, that that's why it's so much fun, is it's a community uh, participation, and together you build something just fantastic. Um, one of those things that I think, I think every single person who's ever opened up one of the player's handbooks has done is, if they didn't explicitly write it down, they still invented in their brains the anti-paladin. I don't even know how the words anti-paladin first entered my mind, but I seriously, I, I knew I had invented it by that name long before there was anything written down, really, about what that was. It's, it's weird. Um, I, I guess the way it works is when you actually open up the book and you see the entry for Paladin, and if you didn't know what that was, it certainly tells you. Essentially, they're the they're the ultimate champions of uh, honor and good. They're defenders of the weak, protectors of the realm. They're valiant. They're noble. They're you know they're chivalrous. They will help anyone in need. If there's ever a hero in the world and the world needs heroes, it's them. You know, there's there's nobody better. They are the knights of the round table. Um, there's Charlemagne's protector and things like that. Um, and I think it, I think it's just logical for everyone who ever saw that entry in a book to think, well, obviously what if there was an evil version of that? Obviously for, for any Obi-Wan Kenobi, there is a Darth Vader, right? There's two sides to every coin for, for every light, there is a dark. So I, th I think everyone just immediately What's the opposite of a paladin? An anti-paladin. Hmm? For some reason, it works. It sounds cool. Um, but yeah, I think everyone just immediately just made it up and made the same thing up. You know, just assume that I think they actually pictured Darth Vader or the Black Knight from Monty Python. Um, but it just seems logical. So uh, and nowadays. In anything third edition and up, I, I could swear that anti-paladin is essentially just a prestige class. Um, there's a lot less mystery to it now because, hell, it's probably a starting class. Um, I don't know. I don't care. Uh, but this is kind of where it started. Um, and it makes sense. Uh, Dungeon Masters as well invented their own versions of anti-paladins because they're, they're a great idea. You've got... It's it's almost not fair that the good guys are the only guys who get paladins. You know, I wish I had an avatar to summon. Well, you can. Um, it just makes sense uh, as the ultimate antagonist for the party. Can you think of something that better personifies, you know, an evil villain, an NPC to oppose the player characters is but the ordained champion of chaotic evil. That would be an anti-paladin, and it, from a from a a dramatic standpoint, it makes sense because you have if there's a paladin in the party, you know, he is. I, I don't want to say he's the number one guy, but if there's a poster boy for that group, you know, if there's anyone who does the initial challenge to the bad guy, you know, like this party's over, you know, Moloch. If there's anyone who's going to do the the noble speech or the finger wagging at a bad guy or something like that. If there's anyone who ends up dueling Darth Vader, it's that guy. So clearly there should be like an evil version of that. It makes sense. So yeah, from a dramatic standpoint, you almost have to have one. I think every single person who DM'd and made their own game up invented at least a guy like that. You know, there's always some guy in black armor, um, and even if he really should be like a, a, a cavalier or a fighter or something, something like just a basic fighter, 
we still called him an anti-paladin. You know, he's he's in service to some evil god. And so, of course, the evil god has granted him dark powers, so he's an anti-paladin. But here's where I was surprised. They're not here in this game. I actually thought there might have been something in Advanced Dungeons & Dragons or older uh, that defined, eventually, I mean, it's not in the core handbook, obviously, but I thought there would be something that defined what an anti-paladin is. And there isn't. Um, even going so far as to check the uh, player's option books, and in case you still don't know what a paladin is, the Paladin's Handbook. If you don't know, this is the answer. It'll tell you. And it'll tell you um, all the different kinds of paladins you can get. Um, and I think it actually goes into fairly extensive historical detail, if you really actually want to know. Um, this is where I would look. But I figured there's a, there's a handbook for every single class. A core class, at least. And I figured if ever there was going to be a book that would have an anti-paladin in it, the paladin's book. They're mentioned here. And I will, I will read to you, it's, it's brief, what they have to say. Anti-paladins. What better nemesis for a paladin than his direct opposite? An anti-paladin that embodies the forces of evil. As the mirror image of a paladin, the anti-paladin might be able to detect the presence of good, generate an aura of protection against good creatures, and wield an unholy sword. Though DMs may experiment with any type of character they like, we discourage the use of anti-paladins. Good and evil are not just merely mirror images of each other. Just as the forces of evil have their unique champions, the paladin is intended as a unique champion for good. The paladin originates from a tradition of dynamic balance, in which the forces of good are few and elite, and in which the forces of evil are numerous and of lesser quality. Allowing anti-paladins blurs this basic relationship. Okay. What it's saying is that... Um, I don't know what it's saying. It's saying that, that the good guy should have something. They should have an ace in... They, they should have something that is just better. You know, they should, they get this one. You know, they, they get the paladins. There's nothing on the side of evil. There should be nothing on the side of evil that really should compare with a paladin. You know what I mean? There's, there's, there is, you can have bad guys. You can have, you know, dark knights. You can have that sort of thing. But in this case, the power of, you know, righteousness and justice, the higher standards to which the paladin holds himself, you know, uh, chivalry, just goodness, you know, obedience to law, faith, heart. In the end, there can be only one. You know, following this code elevates the paladin to a special level. Uh, something that you can't just have a mirror image of that. That just being an asshole, you know, being being a bad guy devoted utterly to an evil god or goddess, shouldn't, it shouldn't be that easy. In fact, if you go back to the Star Wars analogy, is the dark side stronger? Quicker, easier, more seductive, but it's not stronger. You know, it's the, the self-control, willpower, the ability to, you know, believe in something greater and something, you know, to work for something greater. That's what makes the paladin so much more special. And they, they kind of say it, it cheapens that to just have somebody step out of the shadows with glowing eyes and a black helmet uh, and is immediately a match for them. They're saying that um, evil should just inherently be... It, they should be more numerous, but there should be, like... it should There should be a lot of darkness, but with some very, very bright points of light. And those are paladins. And, and the rest of the heroes. So, I get it, but I still want an anti-paladin. I still really want one. Because, I go, it's not like I'm going to throw hundreds of them. I just want one. You know? I, I don't want zillions, but I want this guy to be really, really fucking evil. Okay, so let me have an anti-paladin, alright? Come on. 
I just, come on. I know what you're saying and I agree with you, but come on. You would have just, you could have done something. You could have, you got frigging lazy on me. That's what you did, D&D. You had a whole book. You had a whole book. This frigging book. And there's not one. Come on. You could have, you could have written one up and then put the little box here saying you really shouldn't do this. Okay, I will. Anyway, fuck you. But come on! This, whole, this is such a waste. Why else did you buy this book if not for the... You knew there was going to be an anti-paladin in here. Ah! So, I went through, and I looked through any book that I, I, I figured up there might have anti-paladins in it. There, there weren't many, like the player's option books and stuff like that. I went through the some of the Forgotten Realms books, the setting books, to see if somewhere they had been defined. I went through the Dragonlance books. Uh, because those actually... Dragonlance defines a number of special classes, like the Knights of Salamnia. Um, things like that. Um, no, nothing like that. But I could have sworn... I could have sworn that somewhere there was a write-up for the freaking Anti-Paladin. And I found it. Where? Well, it should have been obvious... But, uh, I'm gonna do an episode on this on its own, but there were two magazines, two magazines that, uh, were published by, um, I believe TSR and later on Wizards of the Coast. One was called Dragon and one was called Dungeon. Uh, Dungeon was, uh, essentially a monthly that published three or four, uh, adventure modules. For all the games that they were publishing at the time, usually Dungeons and Dragons, but they were, I think, um, mostly uh, reader submissions for modules that they had sent in and editorial liked them, and maybe some that were published in house. Dragon, on the other hand, had a lot more to it. Dragon was, uh, it, it featured just all sorts of articles and stuff on the game. Stuff you could use, supplementary stuff, short stories, comics, things like that. It just so happens that in one of these dragon magazines, there was a write-up for an anti-paladin. Um, th this after they just it, they completely discouraged not to do it. Eventually, somebody sent in an anti-paladin. They decided to publish him. The reason, and I don't, you know, honestly, I don't know where. I I I thought I had seen this somewhere. Looking at this, there's no way I could have, because this magazine was published, I believe, the year I was born. So unless, and I might have, unless I went through at one point and went through all the back issues, I, well, I did. I, I went through the back issues, but I, I so don't remember this being in a Dragon magazine. There's, uh, this is legal, by the way. Uh, I have the, uh, the archive CD for all the Dragon magazines. They, they put all of them on a CD, at least the ones before a certain year. So, this is my personal copy. It's legal. If you can find it... Actually, I think that Dragon Magazine disc is, like, impossible to find. So, uh, good luck. But, uh, yeah. This was the article. And it's called... Good Got You Down? Try This for Evil. The Paladin... and Anti-Paladin NPC. It's from Dragon Magazine number 39 which I believe was published in 1980. I'm old. So, when I read this, I posted a picture of this, by the way, as a hint to what episode was coming up, and some of you guessed this right away. How did you do that? If you cheated and did Google Image Search, first off, I can't believe it's in Google Image Search, and B, if you didn't, man, you're good. Um, well, I, I think that's just... If, if you just figured it out, I think that's, it helps me prove my point that you see this, and if you think it's related to D&D, &D, your mind just leaps anti-paladin, right? So, it's one of those things that's like just ingrained in the culture of, of Dungeons & Dragons, right? So, when I first read this, I was kind of, I, I kind of didn't like it. But as I kept going, I go, this class is perfect. Now, they make it very clear. It's an NPC. You cannot, you cannot have this as a PC character. You can't do this. I wouldn't let you, for one. But I, I like how it goes. Um, 
you know, this is an NPC, guys. Seriously, it's an NPC, don't use this. Oh, and by the way, uh, here's the experience chart for them and how they uh, advance in their two hit and their saving throws. But don't use them for PCs, and uh, here's the information to build one. But don't use them, don't. You know, so. I thought that was really cool. Um, this article is written kind of tongue-in-cheek, but that, it's part of why I didn't like it at first. I was going, okay, you're not, tre you're not taking this seriously. I want a serious anti-paladin, please. But as I went on, I realized how much I, I, I like this. So it says, recognizing an anti-paladin should be fairly easy for players. Perhaps it's his preference for black. Black horse, black armor, black sword, or his grim skull-shaped keep raised in black basalt or gleaming obsidian, looming ominously against a gray brooding sky on some chilly windswept mountaintop. I'm like, really? We're going that stereotypical black horse, black armor, black helm, black shield, and a glowing black sword with black light? Yeah. Yeah. Because, and here's the thing, they are the same but the opposite of a paladin. Okay? Paladins where, you know, gleaming armor, awesome shield, have a sword that beams with holy light, and they have a, you know, helm with one of those plumes on top, and they look very resplendent. So obviously, the, the anti-paladin should look like the evil version of that. Bear with me. Look, they, not for a flair of the theatrical, but because, like the regular paladin, they serve a higher power, an evil power, or a lower power, as it were. Um, and paladins are actually not allowed, according to their faith, to hide who they are. They believe in courage, and they believe in piety, and they are never afraid to show their faith, how proud they are of it. So they will not take their holy symbol off. They will not, you know, cover their shield if the holy symbol is on there, and it probably is. Um, if asked about who they serve or what god they revere, they will tell you. They don't lie about these things. They don't and will not hide. And neither will this dude. He's very proud of who he is. And, yep, he'll wear black. All black. Black as night. How much more black could he be? The answer is none. None more black. So, the skull-shaped keep is a bit over the top. Um, but depends on how much you enjoy your work, you know? Um, so it goes on and there was still more things I kind of knee jerked against. I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't like this. But then I kept thinking about it and I liked it more. Um, first off, it removes the charisma requirement um, that paladins normally have. Uh, paladins need a 17 in charisma because they have to be radiant and good looking. Have to, they have to have epic hair. You can't have an ugly paladin. It doesn't work. But these guys... It works either way. They either have to have a really, really high charisma or a really, really low one. Because you can either be a really good-looking, uh, seductive, uh, persuasive type of villain, or you could be butt-ugly. And I mean, like, real ugly. Like Two-Face or Jonah Hex ugly. That kind of ugly. So they're like, it's the uglier you are, the better. So if you have, like, a three, char three charisma or two, that's great. You know, so it just depends on how your, your anti-paladin operates, through intimidation or persuasion. Both will work. So they get a similar list of powers to the normal paladin. Um, they get a plus two bonus in all saving throws. They have immunity to disease. Paladins are immune to disease, in AD&D anyway. Um, but the anti-paladin, while he's immune, he's also a carrier, so it's that kind of immunity, which I think is so brilliant. Um, I was reading the Hackmaster books. Hackmaster is essentially uh, the next version of AD&D had it kept going. It's more than that, obviously. This is a different version of Hackmaster, but the first version is essentially like an evolution of AD&D. It, it plays very similar. Um, it actually did define a starting class called the Dark Knight. Yeah, the Dark Knight, which was essentially an anti-paladin who you, you could not adventure with these guys for reasons that will become very clear to you soon. Um, but they were essentially had the same power list as the Paladin, but with dark turns to them. What I mean when I say is that they're carriers of disease, 
is that stay if you if you stay within proximity of them, you're probably going to catch something. Um, just because they radiate evil and decay and pestilence and disease. So basically, they are walking plagues. Whereas paladins uh, radiate courage that inspires people and irradiate an immunity to fear. These things radiate death. And I was like, that's pretty cool. So much so that I think in one of the Hackmaster books, they actually gave me a really cool idea where um, a dark knight, uh, since he is essentially like a walking disease, um, just for kicks and because it's messed up, he'll just go into a village and spit in their well. And that's enough to infect the infect the well with just malaria or something like that, something worse. So you could have an entire quest about an anti-paladin going around and just being like, <laughs> enjoy the bubonic plague, <laughs> and just walking up. Why? Because that's what they do. You know, that's why, that's how they roll, is they just take a whiz in the, the town well, and sure enough, people just come down with horrible things. You know, huge, oily, seeping boils that are worse than any normal thing. And so, yeah, the... the the local temple like pulls the players aside and says, I've never seen anything like this before. That's like, it's like the plague, but something has made it even more twisted and evil and like tainted. And we, we can't cure it. So maybe they have to take down the anti-paladin to, to stop the, the evil of the plague. You know, it's very simple, but it makes sense. Um, they have lay on hands. Laying on hands is basically the, uh, the paladin gropes you. And a certain, uh, once per day, I believe, they can heal you X number of hit points. Where the uh, the anti-paladin, when he gropes you, it's not as pleasant. You know, it causes pain. Uh, they also get the thief's backstabbing ability, which I thought was crazy. Um, they get a plus four bonus to hit with double damage when they hit if they attack you from behind. I like this. Uh, for, again, for reasons that will become clear in a minute. Uh, they can use poisons. Um, people often misunderstood this. Even uh, uh, some of my group was like, "What? You're not allowed to? <laughs> sorry, you're not allowed to use poisons." I go, "No, you are." But when I say they they can use poison, it's because in in D and D at least the use of poisons is a very tricky thing. It's dangerous. Uh, you know, it's not something that just anybody can start mixing crap together and and make the poisons. Use of poisons uh, implies you can't really buy it in a store. You know, you have to make it. You have to conjure it up and and mix these horribly toxic chemicals together. Pardon me. And then you have to apply it to a blade. And so the use of poisons entails that entire process. At any point when you're trying to apply poison, you could, if, you, if you're not allowed to, you have to make a roll. And if you fail, well, then you injured yourself and you subsequently poisoned yourself. Um, not to mention that the use of poisons is inherently an evil act. At least in this game it is. Uh, so anti-paladins are proficient in the the making, creation, and use of poisons. So I thought that was cool. And combined with that, that's all the other reason why they're proficient in backstab. Uh, also because they're cowards. Um, you're like, that doesn't make sense. Aren't they supposed to be like champions of evil? Yeah, but here's why they're inherently cowards. Um, let's see. Because, it, okay. So they'll surround themselves with evil NPCs, you know, e evil minions and stuff like that, because that's just that if you're a villain, you have to surround yourself with minions. Um, no matter what type of horse the anti-paladin rides, these beasts are red eyed, uh, red eyed and coal black doing double damage when trampling the weak, helpless and aged underfoot. Um, they get clerical spells at, at name level. Um, they wear armor like, like a, any kind of fighter. They, uh, ride a heavy war horse. Here's the thing. Um, when you fight one alone, they're a very tough customer at every level, at, at any level, because they are, they're great fighters. They're essentially the equal to a pallet in that regard. They're still fighters and they're badass. However, you're never going to fight them one-on-one. -on -one. Why? Because they're cowards. And they're always going to throw their minions at you because they don't want to fight you themselves. They're classic wrestling heels. They act like heels basically should act. Even if they're badass, they need to be a little bit craven. And and at least if there's going to be a fight, 
It should not be a fair fight. That's not how they roll. They'll fight you, but not one on one. Not if the odds are fair. If it's not, if if it doesn't, if it's even or it doesn't favor them, it's better to fall back and come back when you've got a plan. And that's what this is what they do. So, um, let's see. They where's the rules for how they uh, how they work with their group? Okay. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, this is another rule I really liked. Um, relations between the... Uh, okay, it's, it says it's actually very hard for an anti-paladin to recruit followers uh, because um, their evil is such that they're, they're, they're prone to abuse, uh, injure, maim, and or kill their own minions, and they're so well known for this that most people aren't stupid enough to want to sign on to work for a guy who is more than likely going to choke them with a gauntleted fist. You know, we don't need the money that bad. So I'm like, that's kind of, that's kind of fun that their, uh, their reputation for cruelty and evil is, is such that if the guy comes around and he, you know, he opens it, he's like, who wants to work for Darth Grimlock? Not many people are going to raise their hands, even if they're really desperate for cash. Especially since I heard he killed Farmer Joe yesterday. He just tore his face off because he looked at him funny. You know, so that was cool. Um, they will have, they often have the undead, demons, devils, and the undead, depending on their level. Um, they often raise a stronghold. Uh, where's the rule? Okay, here it is. Um... So here's how the anti-paladin typically acts. It's, it gives, it's, it's playing the anti-paladin if you're a DM. Uh, unlike most evil types, the anti-paladin disdains hack and slash as a primary means of it, obtaining his goals, preferring the more subtle and devious approach of a Fu Manchu. As a case in point, consider the kidnapping of a local princess on the eve of her wedding to a foreign prince. Naturally, the anti-paladin will demand a large but not excessive ransom from her father for her safe return. Uh, however, when the emissaries arrive with the gold, they are ambushed by the anti-paladin's retainers in disguise and slaughtered to a man, except one. That one would be spared in order to carry the grim news back to the girl's father. <laughs> At that point, the anti-paladin sends his regards over the loss of the ransom money and the destruction of the caravan, which was undoubtedly bandits or marauding orcs, while renewing his original demand. So he shows up, he's like, oh, God, I heard about your gold convoy getting attacked. I'm sorry about that. But I still need to get paid. <laughs> so what, it says once the second ransom is paid, he would soon tire of the girl and sell her into slavery afterwards. All right, I'm like, okay, once the second ransom is paid, what? who's going to be dumb enough to buy that, like, oh, bandits attacked you. Damn, I'm sorry about that. So uh, I'm still waiting for my cash. Like you don't really think that he, you don't really buy this story that you know it's random bandits attack the gold caravan, do you? You've, you've got Lord Evil strolling down the the hallway, you know, trying not to cackle in glee that he just totally took you for this money, and he really thinks you're gonna send another wagon full of gold. I don't think so. Might, I don't know. But that's actually where the players would come in, I suppose. You know, the, the local lord hires these guys, tells them the story, and he says, look, I'll pay the ransom, but I want you guys to go with the gold. Maybe that would be the setup. Um, although even the players would be like, you're going to pay him again? <laughs> Let's just go get him. Which, whatever, what do you want? Um, Thus he would gain two ransoms and the price of a highborn slave girl at virtually no risk to himself. Of course, Daddy might then show up on the anti-paladin's doorstep with a large army and or siege train in tow, but that's an occupational hazard. The, the, now, in, my, in this scenario, my first question was, how is he, uh, how is this anti-paladin, like, delivering his demands, you know, and, and his condolences over the lost money in the first place? Does he, does he actually have the balls to walk into the guy's castle and be like, hey, I'm waiting, or 
does he send like an orc with a letter or my favorite idea is that he somehow has a medieval fantasy version of the Dr. Evil TV screen that he just calls up any time and he's like, here's the plan for the return of your daughter. I want one million gold pieces. And then he just cuts the feed, you know, so I, I don't know. He has like a cauldron or a scrying orb that makes a, make a picture appear like on Star Trek with the viewing, whatever. So here's where I really started to like this. I didn't like it first, but I really started to like it. The, the one really fatal flaw in the anti-paladin is his lack of courage. Despite his fearsome strength and formidable appearance, he's in reality a sniveling coward at heart. So long as he's surrounded by retainers while ambushing an inferior and outnumbered opponent, the anti-paladin's morale cannot, seriously, cannot be seriously questioned. However, when faced by his nemesis, the paladin, or a lawful good cleric, or any character of good alignment, there's an excellent chance the anti-paladin's true nature will reveal itself. Provided these opponents equal or surpass him in experience, he must check his morale immediately upon facing any one of these types in single combat. He never need check initial morale against an inferior opponent, or one not included in the categories above. So, if there's a guy who's obviously, like, a good guy, he doesn't want nothing to do with him. Now, reason for that. What I didn't like was, like, what, they're cowards? Yeah, they're cowards. Because the paladin is immune to fear. You can't scare them. They have a magic or inherent inability to be scared. So if you have the opposite of these guys, they're cowards. They're badass, so long as they're, they've got the edge, you know. But if there's any kind of semblance of a fair fight or there's any real chance they might get hurt by the hero of the story, oh no, no, fuck this. You guys, go get them. And so they'll wait to see, they'll kind of wait to see how it plays out and then, then they'll sneak in there. So I like that deviousness. Um, <laughs> the base chance that the anti-paladin will react and basically uh, flee in a cowardly manner is 50% when facing a paladin, 25% against all others. Uh, this decreases by 5% with each for each retainer within 60 feet. So, yeah, it, it basically gives them a, a list of uh, behaviors that they will, uh, they will act by in combat because of their very unique heel nature. Know, uh, depending on how much of an advantage they have, how close into the fight they'll be. So basically to fight these guys, you've got to corner them. Otherwise, they're going to be the biggest, most annoying, just recurring villains, which is what you want, but they are just going to harry you from the back. They can they can still heal their minions with their, with their grope on hands. You know, they can still shoot poison arrows all they want. And at high enough levels, they can still cast magic and stuff. So the real key here is that they are legitimately a villain to be feared. But you got to catch them first. So they're the only attack when there's an advantage. So I, I really like that. Um, scenarios for the anti-paladin. A lot of a lot of princess kidnapping but that's where i come from saying this article is very tongue-in-cheek um so it kind of makes them in, it kind of makes them into a dr evil type of character um the the stereotypical supervillain almost um but at the same time in this case that's not a bad idea um i i wouldn't play it as funny as all that because you are still talking about guys who were like irredeemably horribly torturously evil you know, they should not be yelling curses foiled again, as it suggests in this one. But if you're dealing with, if, if you want to deal with a villain for the campaign, who is pretty much the opposite of, of Sturm Brightblade or whatever, that sounds like the guy. Where Sturm Brightblade would march nobly into the center of the room and bare his sword and be like, face me, coward! The anti-paladin would kind of sneak up, look, look over through his window, and he's like, oh, pathetic! Look at you down there! Oh no, I don't think I need to come down there. Why don't you have a... Why don't you say hello to my welcoming committee? And, you know, he sends his guys. And he'll be uh, he'll be in his throne room, getting ready. He's, he'll, he'll be kidnapping more mares. That should really annoy Lord British. 
So, um, it also mentions how they react to their, uh, how much they charge for their servant. What? At no, under no circumstances will they join or even consider joining a party with lawful good or lawful good characters in it. Oh, that, okay, if you're hiring them as like a, anything, they will demand an ungodly share of any treasure found at least 50%, as well as first choice on all magical items and payment for his services. I guess if you're trying to raise an evil army and there's an anti-paladin around, he might be worth it. They're good administrators. You definitely don't rebel when they're around or he'll choke you to death. So that, my friends, is an anti-paladin. They're in other games. Uh, in, in newer editions, they're a lot more common. I think, actually, in the newer editions, by making them a prestige class, first off, Who's letting players be the whatever? But by sheer virtue of by virtue of actually including them in the books, in a way, it makes what I read in the Paladin's Handbook kind of a reality. Um, I find it does, in fact, cheapen what a Paladin is by having anti-Paladins be a common occurrence. So, in a way, I think it's actually good that they exist, and also good that whatever write-up there was in uh, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons was in Dragon Magazine number 39, near the back of the issue, made on the year I was born. So, if you want one, you gotta go looking. Because they're few and far between. Very few. And uh, when you find one, you better be special. Because otherwise, the Paladin's gonna wonder what the hell he's been you know, dedicating his life to, if anyone, if just anyone can be like this guy. So, I hope that helped, and I hoped that helped, uh, that helped inspire you if you're trying to make a game and find a, a proper villain for your campaign, and how exactly he should act. The opposite of a paladin. No balls, but he looks good in black. <laughs>